Guy Benson, here. Born on Willard Scott's birthday. Do you know that? <laughs> I learned something today. <laughs> uh, is an American columnist, commentator, political pundit, contributor to Fox News, political editorial editor of townhall.com, and conservative talk show host. Benson is a frequent guest on cable news networks, as we've just mentioned. And in May 2015, together with co-author Mary uh, Catherine Ham, who if you've heard her on radio is dynamite, she's very good. Uh, Benson published his first nonfiction book, the title of which, uh, you need a full page, I think, the full title. It's End of Discussion, colon, how the left's outrage industry shuts down debate, manipulates voters, and makes America less free and fun. True? I mean, a critique of political correctness in politics, media, culture, from the point of view of two millennial conservatives. His topic today is an all-encompassing one, but we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff today. Is how the current political landscape will influence your future. That's a broad perspective. This morning, how many of you are at the Bill Crystal lecture? Okay, uh, Bill Crystal, I think he used to be a Republican, didn't he? <laughs> he, he? I mean, claims to be. Yeah. Yeah. He he gave a thing about the, the topic is the center. You know, where did the center go, and is it reclaimable? So I'd like to have you just comment on that for a few moments before we get into some other. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Paul. This is very exciting. What a beautiful place. I've never been here before. I almost didn't make it. So <laughs> last night there were travel nightmares, the likes of which you probably have seen at some point, but it was very unpleasant. And uh, at 9 p.m. my final flight was canceled and I rented a car and drove from D.C. So I... Paul, Paul very kindly offered to do a Zoom call. I said, oh, that's so sad. Let's not do that. Uh, and what a glorious day it is. And also, thank you for that very kind introduction. In fact, I have a new appreciation recently for kind introductions because do you guys ever watch Gutfeld? Yes. A cup, right? So I do that show about once a month. And if you're familiar with how it works, when he introduces the panel, you have no idea what he's about to say about you except there's a camera trained on your face with two million people watching, and he's going to make a joke almost every time at your expense, and it's just going to happen. So, for example, I think one or two times ago, he said, if he looked any younger, he would be sitting in Kevin Spacey's lap. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, Greg. So this was much nicer than that. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I, I wasn't able to uh, make it to, to Bill's talk. Um, Bill, of course, was at Fox for years as, yeah. as one of the conservative commentators. I've met him once or twice. I don't know him well. Uh, I'm sure we agree on some things still and, and maybe disagree on some other things. Um, I will say not just about him, but a certain group of people in political media. I feel like Donald Trump, we might mention him again later, uh, broke some people. Uh, on both sides of the political spectrum. And I've just been fascinated. I've never been a big Trump fan, I'll put it mildly. But what I believe politically is what I've believed for my adult life. And I didn't change those beliefs because I liked or disliked one man. And it's been peculiar, and, and I'm not saying this is necessarily about Bill in particular, but there's some who are worse where things that they have espoused their entire careers, all of a sudden they're on the other side because they don't like one guy. That's just very strange to me. Um, you know, you've got, you've got the never Trump crowd who um, have spun off into a hatred of the man. You've got the always Trump people who just sort of defend everything he does, including the indefensible. I'm sort of, to borrow a phrase from my friend Ben Shapiro, sometimes Trump. Right, there's never Trump, always Trump. I'm sometimes Trump. If I think he's doing the right thing and saying good things, I like it. If not, I don't. Um, so that's sort of my philosophy in approaching him as this sort of massive, all-encompassing, oxygen-sucking figure in our politics for the last six years. As for the center, look, people would probably accuse me of being, you know, a squishy rhino, whatever you want, establishment. I've heard it all. 
Uh, I'm quite conservative on some things. I'm more libertarian or even liberal on a few things. I try to take issue by issue, analyze them, and land somewhere. And I try to be intellectually honest about it. So you might say I'm closer to the center than a lot of people in my line of work. That being said, I think if we're going to have an honest conversation about reclaiming the political center, I think, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think a lot of people on the left these days would say, well, that's really a problem on the right because the right has just gotten crazier and crazier and here we are, just our, our wonderful centrist selves uh, and we might seem more left than them because they're crazy. Um, I would submit to you that on policy, the left has moved farther left than the right has moved right over the last decade or two in this country, which is not to say, which is not to say that the right doesn't have some serious problems when, within the movement or within the party uh, and some policy issues with which I disagree. But if you look at where the Democrats were, even during the Obama presidency versus where they are now on a host of issues, it's sort of night and day. And while Donald Trump has all sorts of flaws, especially personally, and we can get into some of that perhaps, he's actually kind of moderate on policy especially on some social policies. He is not of the right wing of the right wing of the Republican Party. He isn't. Sometimes to my chagrin, I wish he were more conservative on some things. Um, but to see the, the positions that, I mean, forget JFK, you know, forget Carter, forget Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, if he had stayed stagnant in his positions from 2008, would be sort of at the right end of the political spectrum within his party today. Now, he's moved with the rest of them as the Overton window shifts. But I think an honest conversation, as I said, about what reclaiming the center would entail has to start with a clear-eyed understanding of where the center has shifted and how it's not just a problem on one end of the spectrum. And I would, in fact, say, I didn't hear what Bill said. I would guess he probably pointed the finger at his former tribe, but his, his brand new adoptive tribe, I think, has been tugging the country, uh, in some cases, kicking and screaming in a direction that bears no resemblance to you know, Clintonite uh, Democratic Party politics. Uh, and the last thing that I'll say just about Bill Crystal is, and again, I haven't spoken to him in years, and I'm sure we'd have a very pleasant drink together if we had to, but my treat, Bill, I, I would, what I would ask him maybe is, I can understand breaking with the party on Trump and being unable to countenance him or what have you, but when he endorsed Terry McAuliffe over Glenn Youngkin in Virginia, like, what are we doing here? Glenn Youngkin is the normal, nice, sunny, right of center conservative that you, I thought, were saying the Republicans needed to be and Trump wasn't, and now here you have this guy, and you've endorsed Terry McAuliffe. That, that, that to me is no longer someone trying to reclaim conservatism or republicanism. That's a Democrat, and if, if he wants to be a Democrat, God bless, you do you, everyone ch can change in life. You don't have to stay one place. I'm sure some of you have changed your mind about some things in life, but I, I grow a little weary of people claiming to be the true avatars of what conservatism ought to be and then they go and choose Terry McAuliffe over Glenn Youngkin. I'm absolutely off that train. Okay, I think that's a, good, that's a good synopsis. One thing he did say today was that we didn't, we don't want everybody to be all everybody in the center. That we need a yin and yang, which is true. I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, nothing, nothing wrong with that, uh, because you do need to see different angles and everything else with it. But he did spend some lot of time saying how Trump. Uh, further divided everybody. He exacerbated the divisiveness. Okay. Probably also true. Yes, okay. We, want to, we have a lot of other topics okay. to cover, okay? I just wanted to comment on that. Um, we have, needless to say, a presidential election coming up, and we have, uh, in the Republican side, a myriad candidates. Um, what is your view about them? Uh, their relative merits. I mean, we know Trump is way ahead, at least in the polls. Uh, but there's some people who clearly, Asa Hutchinson, for example, I mean, there's no chance. You mean the front runner? Yeah. Asa Hutchinson? 
I, I, it escapes me why some people decide to, to take this particular plunge. I, people have different motivations for running for president. Some of them seriously think they can be president. Others have uh, maybe uh, other ideas in mind. Overall, so taking off my what I would prefer hat and just an analysis hat, at this point, which is still ludicrously early, Donald Trump is clearly far and away the front runner for the domination. Uh, it's just, you, you can't look at it any other way. It's undeniable. Um, now, you know, if you talk to the DeSantis people or, or, you know, the Haley people or whomever, they'll sort of talk about how he's soft here and soft there and look at the early states, and that's all true. Um, and some of the polling that you'll see in Iowa, some of it internal, some of it public, uh, the lead is, is not as strong, and voters don't go to the polls or they don't start to caucus until mid to late January of next year. So we have half a year, it's an eternity in politics, all of that. But Trump is not the incumbent, but he is a former president. He's been a declared candidate for the presidency this cycle since November of last year. I mean, he's been running for the 2024 nomination forever, it feels like. And he took a big hit in the Republican polling just after the midterm elections. Yeah. Uh, I think there was sort of this moment of sobriety where the party said, oh my God, like that election didn't go as well as it should have, not even close. Maybe we need to turn the page. And you saw DeSantis have a big moment. Uh, he, of course, won by 20 points in Florida, which is an extraordinary feat. But since then, Trump has done what Trump does, which is he just attracts a huge amount of attention. Even if it's getting indicted, it benefits him uh, in, Republic <laughs> he's, in Republican politics, at least, right? He's gotten his indictment bounce in the polls, right? That's a thing now. I'm not sure it'd be a thing for anyone else, but for him, it's an indictment bounce uh, twice, and maybe more to come, I guess we'll see. Uh, and he's just kind of steamrolling this thing. Uh, DeSantis is strongly in second place. No one else is close to him. So you've got Trump, and then down here is DeSantis, then there's everyone else. Yeah. Um, I know that one of the narratives that's taken root in the last couple of weeks, because I think the news media generally would like to run against Donald Trump again. I think they're mostly Democrats and would like to run against Trump because they think they'd beat him. I think they hate DeSantis and don't want to run against him. I think they're afraid of him. That being said, you know, they, they, they're hammer and tongs uh, at DeSantis every day and Trump, uh, for the most part, I think they'll really go after him after he becomes the nominee, if he does. The, the narrative is, oh, DeSantis is really uh, tanking. If you look at the polling averages, he's not. He's exactly, almost exactly where he was when he announced uh, in the polling average nationally, uh, which is perhaps a, uh, a debunking of the narrative, but also not great for him mm -hmm. because he hasn't gained ground on yeah. Trump. Yeah. Everyone else, is just frozen. You'll see, you know, Vivek come up a little bit or whatever. Nikki Haley's been running the second longest of anyone in this cycle. She's been just bouncing along at four or five, sometimes 6%. So the field is frozen right now. Can the field unfreeze? Can we see some significant movement? I know a lot of people have next, like next month, I think it's the 23rd of August is the first debate in Milwaukee. Uh, people have that circled on their calendar. Okay, this will be interesting. Could this be a game changer? Maybe. Uh, I'm not 100% convinced Donald Trump will participate. Is that good or bad? For who? For Trump. You can make both arguments. Uh, I think he's getting some counsel, including from Newt Gingrich, by the way, who came out and basically said publicly, you know, he's effectively an incumbent and a huge front runner. Why would you show up on the debate stage um, when you're doubling everyone else up and then some. Uh, but I also think Trump, I don't know if he can resist it. Yeah. You know, it's just like, it's like, it's gonna be a lot of people watching. <laughs> and we're gonna kill him anyway, aren't we folks? We're gonna kill them all. Um, by the way, the Trump, the Trump impression, you just, you cover the guy like every day for seven years, and I find myself starting to do the hand motions. I'm like, stop that. Do not start with the hand motions. I think my favorite Trump tick 
in his public speaking is, is when he was president for the most part, when it was important enough that he had to read a speech. Mm -hmm. He couldn't just shoot from the hip and do his, you know, dog and pony show and play all the hits and riff. He had to actually read it off the teleprompter. So someone would write a speech for him. And then it's just so obvious he's never read the words before in his life, right? <laughs> he, is, he is learning with the country what he's saying. Um, and he's reading. And uh, there will be the, these occasional moments in these teleprompter speeches where he will read a sentence out loud, and then he'll pause, and he'll reflect on it. He'll be like, it's so true. That's so true. <laughs> I'm like, well, yes, yes, sir, it is technically your speech. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you agree with it. That always, that always got me. And the thing is, as I've established, I'm not a big Trump guy at all. He can be very entertaining and very funny. Uh, and there's something to that, right? There, there's all the anger and the rage out there. Occasionally, he's just really funny um, in a way that many of our politicians aren't. Uh, and that's one of his, I think, like secret magic powers that he has. Uh, so look, I, I don't know if this trajectory is going to change. I, I think it's very obvious that Ron DeSantis has to probably win Iowa outright um, in order to really shake things up. Uh, can he? I think he can. Um, I've spoken to him publicly on the air and privately a few times. He's got a very smart team. Um, they've got a plan. They've got resources. He had a huge uh, fundraising quarter, even though it was a partial quarter. There's a, lot of, <clears throat> there's a lot of interest there. What they're going to eventually need, if he's still in second place, they'll need consolidation, which didn't happen in 2016. Uh, whether that happens in time for someone else to really have a shot at beating Trump in the nominating process, I don't know. Um, let me, let me just ask you, uh, Hugh Hewitt on the air the other day said that he thought that those Republican, Republican side who didn't get the 40,000 signatures that they needed, mm -hmm. that they should just get out. Yeah. I mean, just drop out. If Which, you can't even make the debate stage, yeah. there is no point to having you in the race. Right. Now, whether you can tell a politician you need to drop out and he'll or she'll listen, that's a different story. And look, I'm open to the idea that it'll be someone other than DeSantis yeah. as that, you know, the final, mm -hmm. the final matchup here. Right now, though, I don't see it, right? No one else is close to DeSantis. Uh, there's rumblings that a guy like Youngkin could eventually get in. I don't really, I love Youngkin, but I don't see yeah. him being the type of nominee that the party wants right now. Uh, if I had to put my money down, I would say the nominee will be one of two people, Trump or DeSantis, in all likelihood. And if I had to bet on one or the other right now, obviously I'd put my money on Trump. Mm -hmm. That's not my preference, that's my analysis. Right. Things can change, we're six months away, um, but DeSantis has to figure out a way to break through in a way that hasn't worked yet. Um, and I think just being consistently more right-wing than Trump on everything, mm -hmm. which is what he seems to be leaning into right now, doesn't strike me as necessarily the ticket to success, because that's what Ted Cruz tried last time and failed. Yeah. There's two things. One is that whenever people ask me that question, and I'm not a pundit, I just observe like everybody else does, I always say, uh, DeSantis is Trump light. You know, he's without the angst and all the name calling and stuff that we don't like about Trump, but his policies are, in Florida anyway, I live there, uh, are pretty good. Oh yeah, I mean, and, I, and nobody can argue the thing about you. Nobody can argue about Trump's performance. You may not have liked the way he did it, but I mean, when he pulls the money from NATO and he, you know, all the good stuff, you say, "Gee, why are we supporting this?" For all the good reasons. Now, let's turn on the other side. Okay. Um, and talking about speakers and speeches, uh, it is painful to watch our president speak. I wasn't sure if you were going to say president, vice president, White House well, press okay. secretary. I mean, it, there's a lot of options yeah. to finish the sentence there. Well, and it, as, I mean, I'm not the first one who said this. You probably said it yourself that the, the biggest insurance that Biden has uh, against impeachment is his vice president. Okay, because <laughs> they say, "Oh my God, what are we? <laughs> we get rid of him. We've got oh, I love the Zen diagram. I love it." Anyway, and, and, your turn. Oh boy. Um, so 
President Biden is the incumbent and is in all likelihood going to be the nominee. Um, I am not 100% convinced that in November of next year, it'll be him on the ballot, but 80% confidence maybe. Um, it is interesting, in the last two days, there was a big story in Axios about how Biden is actually not a nice guy um, and how he berates his staff and drops F-bombs constantly. And they said he has a carefully cultivated image of loving his sunglasses and ice cream and grandchildren, but he's, you know, dressing down staffers and profanely screaming at them all the time. I'm like, okay, that's an interesting story to get written now. Uh, and that came on the heels of Maureen Dowd's New York Times column, taking him to the woodshed for not acknowledging his own granddaughter, yeah. uh, which is really gross. I mean, a very unseemly thing, as, especially for someone, his whole thing, oh, decency is on the ballot, and you look at me and my very decent, very Catholic, loving family versus that guy. That's how they, I'm just sort of America's kindly, normal, moderate grandfather. That's how he presented himself to voters in 2020. It worked. He let Trump talk himself into defeat. The basement strategy was smart and successful. Uh, I think, though, when, when you're presenting yourself that way, if you're then screaming and cursing at your staffers and not acknowledging your own flesh and blood because it's politically inconvenient, that undercuts, let's say, the carefully cultivated image that he's going for. Um, it is awfully hard to uproot an incumbent who wants to run for re-election. Uh, he's going to run basically unopposed, it seems. Uh, you know, Gavin Newsom is sort of floating around with his slicked back hair, just like a shark, just waiting for his moment. If it's not, if it's not Biden, I think he'll jump right in and, and say, you know, sort of on the break glass emergency option. I think Kamala Harris, the vice president, would have something to say about that. Uh, they go way back. Gavin and Kamala go way back in California. They made this sort of famous backroom, smoke-filled room deal where they were on this collision course for power in the state, and someone got them in a room and decided, okay, you'll be senator and you'll be governor and don't kill each other. And that has worked out for both of them. But if they both end up wanting the next job, uh, that'll be interesting. And, and we know exactly the way that she'll play it. Her team has done this. Whenever there's a story about her incompetence, her lack of retention of staff or whatever, immediately her defenders come out and play the sex and race cards. And, and those are very potent things in our society, especially in democratic politics. That, you know, that being said, she didn't even make it to Iowa as a presidential candidate because the democratic base watched her campaign and saw what we all see every day and said it can't be her. And then they put her on the ticket anyway. So I think that they are, they are stuck with her. I think they're stuck with him. I think they're doing this in all likelihood again together. And depending on who they run against, they have, in spite of it all, a decent shot to win again. Um, Do they have a better shot with Trump oh, as opposed to with DeSantis, I, let's say? Yes, is my opinion, which is not to say Trump can't win. Because a lot of smart people said Trump can't win in 2016, and then he did. Uh, now, I think it's a very different political environment today versus then. Um, we didn't have a Trump record, which I think for the most part was good, uh, although he could have trumpeted that record in one re-election, and for various reasons he didn't. Uh, but he has something of a story to tell there. Then, of course, there's the whole post-presidency. Um, denying the election, January 6th, what have you. A lot of people on the right don't care about those things and think they're very overblown. A lot of swing independent voters who decide elections in places like Georgia do care. So I think we've seen this matchup before. I'm not eager to see a rematch. Um, I think the Democrats are. But look, we have an 80-year-old president who struggles at times, um, to put it kindly. Uh, and who also has an approval rating that is poor, that he has richly earned for himself. And if, as is totally possible, there's a recession next year in the middle of an election, someone could beat that, even if it's someone who is not popular. My general thought is I would prefer to give the Republican Party the best chance of winning, not the inside straight maybe chance of winning. And I think 
Uh, obviously, voters will have to make that decision for themselves. I can make my case on TV and radio and in print, and I do, uh, but ultimately, I think a lot of the momentum in those first three states will matter, and if Trump wins two or three of those first three, I think he'll just waltz. He yeah. Uh, one other thing, and I'm, many of you people probably have experienced the same thing. I have a lot of friends, uh, college classmates, intelligent people, uh, that I talk to who are liberals. And when I say, so what about the border? Oh, that's not a big problem. They, so every single issue that we are concerned about, they seem to not identify as being a problem. And I don't know why that is the case. Do you run into that? I mean, well, well it's, it's, so why? it's the media for the most part, right? The media, the news media is broadly speaking a democratic super PAC. The, I mean, you, it is these newsrooms, these elite coastal newsrooms are populated with very progressive Democrats. And if you see Democrats getting really pushed by journalists, it's often from the left. Why aren't you progressive enough? Why aren't you doing, even, doing this even more type of thing? Um, so, you know, they, it's much easier for the Democrats to dominate narratives when you have 90% of the news media on your side. Uh, but look, I think the American people are, generally speaking, smarter than that. Uh, the, the border crisis is what it is, and Biden's approval rating is horrific on it because people can see. Uh, and, and the Republicans did some pretty good jujitsu, I think, with flying some of the migrants to sanctuary cities and, you know, DeSantis putting them on a plane to Martha's Vineyard. I know they're like, they were all furious about it. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. And Greg Abbott's been doing it. It forced them to talk about an issue that they wanted to pretend didn't exist. Right. And as soon as there's attention paid to the issue, people wake up and say, oh my God, what a mess down there. And then there's the hypocrisy stuff. Yeah. Like they, they were, they went to Martha's Vineyard for what, 24 hours, and they gave them sleeping bags and a Bach lunch. Oh, we're so wonderful. Hate has no home here. And then they were deported from the island the next day. <laughs> okay, wow. Uh, you're so you're so impressive and progressive. Yeah, to to, uh, to substantiate your comment about the, the press being in their camp, Fareed Zakaria the other night interviewed the president. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I wish I had the verbatim from this. I'm just. He praised the President Biden for his great ideas and his presidency, how he's lowered inflation, pursued relentlessly climate change, fought for human rights. I mean, every, he ticked off five or six things. Well, he said you brought the economy back. Yeah. All right, so it was just a damn super PAC stuff. It's just like a nationally televised tongue bath. It's like <laughs> somewhat pornographic, actually. <laughs> okay. no, but no one wants to watch that video. It was on CNN, so yes. sorry. Uh, what, I, I just want to uh, touch briefly, because we could talk for 10 hours on this, about the weaponizing of the DOJ and the FBI. Uh, and what Ooh. do we do about it more than anything? Another reason why I think having someone who is shrewd and ruthless and competent as a Republican nominee for president, and then hopefully president, is someone has to go in there and do massive reforms against their will. And I think you need to have someone who has the wherewithal and the discipline to do that. And I understand, especially on the Russia stuff, for example, you know, it drove Trump crazy, it would drive anyone crazy. It was like a completely made up thing. And they had it hang over his presidency for, for years. Right, and the Durham report comes out and it's devastating and people say, oh, this is nothing. It's like, it's enough to make anyone crazy. But I think raging and all caps tweeting or truthing or whatever, it, that's one thing, emoting. Another thing is actually doing something about it effectively and I think it takes uh, savvy and discipline. Um, so do with that what you will. Um, that's a political point, but look, I was somewhat at the beginning of the whole Russia saga. It's like, all right, let's see where the evidence takes us. And a deep state, that's maybe a bit strong language. I don't know. And here I am, like, oh my God. It's like absolutely a real thing. Um, and just if you read the Durham report, it is infuriating. And, and the one that really gets me, since Hunter Biden is very much in the news these days, <laughs> is... We have the, the Hunter Biden fan club in the room, I hear, <laughs> over on this side. Um, 
the way, it's actually quite scary. In the weeks leading up to the last presidential election, there was a legitimate bona fide news story based on an authentic cache of information that was decreed to be Russian disinformation by a political campaign and the entire party and almost all of the news media and social media giants just fell in line with the assistance of 51 intelligence uh, community, including high-ranking, well-respected alumni. I mean, that is, talk about collusion. That was an astonishing example of collusion to impact an election. And the whole point was, this is a problem, my theory on this is, there was this collective guilt in the news media about Hillary's email scandal, which was a real scandal that I think she should have been charged for. I'm also very tough on Trump on the Mar-a-Lago documents and the obstruction, so I'm, I'm consistent on this. But I think she should have been charged for what she did. And they treated it seriously enough that they think they lost her the election, and they were not gonna let that happen again. So here came a potentially damaging story, 11th hour for their preferred party, and they put the job of beating Trump above the job of journalism or any sense of fairness. And I guess mission accomplished. Congratulations, America. We've got this man as president and we've got public trust in a whole host of institutions at record lows. Deservedly so, but it's a bad place for the country to be in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we have one more topic to cover before we go to Q&A. And that is uh, the LGBTQ issue, which we here at the institution have been living with uh, in significantly uh, for the last three years. And I'd just like to have you address the recent Supreme Court ruling on the 303R, mm -hmm. and then relate it back maybe to the Masterpiece Cake sure. situation and your feelings about it. Yeah. Um so I had, I, it's so funny, the case was decided or at least announced the decision l not last Friday but the previous Friday, which was the first day of my vacation. And so everyone was sending me notes, what do you think about this case? And I had so, and I tweeted about some of it. I wanted to be on the air. I'm like, I'm not going on the air. You're on vacation. <laughs> but I, I ended up like on Twitter for like six hours. My family was displeased. Um, <laughs> The reason why, if you don't know, the reason why I think a lot of people were asking me about it is because I am conservative and I'm gay. And so there was a lot of, uh, it seems like there's a lot of histrionics uh, over Supreme Court rulings in general, especially the big ones. Although, quick little factoid, from this last, this last term that just ended, 50% of Supreme Court decisions were unanimous. Do you ever hear that? No. 50, half of them are unanimous. You never hear about that. In 89% of the rulings in this past term, there was at least one of the liberal justices in the majority. The newest justice, Katanji Brown Jackson, was in the majority more than Justice Thomas or Alito from this last term. You would never hear those facts because it's a rogue right-wing court with ethics problems running roughshod over precedent. That's the story that they're telling you, and it's nonsense. This is a little side rant. Thanks for indulging me. Uh, <laughs> on, on the issue itself, in your kind introduction, you mentioned the book that I co-authored in 2015, End of Discussion, uh, which was kind of this clarion call, early warning against cancel culture before that term even existed. We called it the outrage mob. We said this is not a good way for our society uh, to, to go, uh, where we you know, deprive people of a living because they tweeted something or you know, um, hair trigger offense, all of it. Uh, so we wrote this book eight years ago. Uh, the country didn't listen to us, sadly, um, but I think a lot of the work stands up. And one of the chapters in our book was about some of the tensions between LGBT rights and religious liberty and First Amendment questions. Uh, the title of the chapter was, Bake Me a Cake, Bigot. <laughs> <laughs> and in the chapter, which I took the lead on, um, I actually came out publicly for the first time. My family, my friends knew, uh, the public, the general public did not, and I did it in a footnote, literally in a footnote, uh, in the book, and ended up doing two interviews about it. I wanted to do it all on my own terms. But one of the things that Mary Catherine and I explored in that chapter was this concept of authentic coexistence in a free country in a pluralistic society. And 
you all certainly, they might even have a few of them around here, the coexist bumper stickers, yeah. right? The, oh, yeah. the blue bumper sticker yeah. says coexist. You've got the crescent and the star of David and the cross and all of that. It's sort of like a little morality billboard on your fender, like attention fellow motorists, I'm a good person, <laughs> right? That's kind of what that's about. And it, it is a virtue signal for a lot of people with the bumper sticker, except if you have it here and, and present company accepted, of course. Um, our point was, in far too many cases of people who fancy themselves coexistence fetishists, what they actually should have is a bumper sticker that looks almost exactly the same, but it says coerce. Because that's more of what we've seen on this front. So what we said, if we actually as a country wanted to live in meaningful coexistence, what could that look like on these issues? And we sort of posited a world where someone like me could marry the person that I love and uh, have that right, where I can live my life free of discrimination in the workplace or elsewhere. And if you're a small business owner who has a religious objection to my marriage, you don't have to participate in it. Uh, at the risk of being sued out of existence, right? That to me looks kind of like coexistence. I do me, you do you, and by the way, there's so many florists who would love to take my money, right? I don't have to pick the one who doesn't on this one front and try to ruin her. And what this case that was just decided, because they, they kept punting on this set of issues. The Masterpiece Cake Shop, they kind of slapped down Colorado, but not fully. So here was another case out of Colorado. And the facts of the case were basically around um, a web designer, a female web designer in Colorado who didn't want to make wedding websites for same-sex couples. That was what she said. And Colorado stipulated, the, the, gov the government said, yes, if someone comes and asks her to do this and she refuses, we will go after her under this law. So uh, this was a, sort of like a preemptory challenge. It was a pre-enforcement challenge to the law. And what the court ultimately decided was the state cannot force someone into speech with which they disagree. So it wasn't really a religious liberty question. It was a different component of the First Amendment. It was a speech and expression question. And I think where I come down, the sort of the, the coexistence model that I just described is where most Americans are. I think if, if you polled the country, and there have been, and you can sort of stitch together the polls, you have massive support now for gay marriage, but also massive support for letting people just kind of do their thing and not punishing folks for disagreement and drumming them out of society and uh, conscientious objection and that kind of thing. And, and so this was not a religious liberty case. It's not how the decision turned. And also, this is massive misinformation and just stupid ignorance being spread, some of it intentionally. Uh, I saw a lot of people freaking out saying, now businesses can simply refuse to serve gay people. And I said, no, that is absolutely not what the case decided. In fact, the woman in the case stipulated that she will serve LGBT people. She just doesn't want to use her creative services specifically for wedding websites. So this is not a blanket denial of service, which I think would be a problem. You can't say, oh, well, I have a religious problem with a racial minority, so I'm not going to serve them at all. I don't like gay people. I'm going to say it's religion. I'm not going to serve them in any capacity. This is a question about compelled speech, compelled expression. And I think in a free country, that is a pluralistic society where I think most of us do coexist and want to coexist, the balance that has been struck is the correct one. And if you look at the jurisprudence since 2015, so you have Obergefell, which was the same-sex marriage decision, Justice Kennedy, five to four, which yeah, yeah, I liked the outcome. <laughs> I liked the outcome, and I, in, in fact, am now married. It's funny. As a, as a quick note, uh, I get this sometimes from the hardcore fringes on the right and the left, especially the gay left, where some right-wingers will tell me, well, you're not really a conservative because you're gay. I'm like, what? Really? I got, want lower taxes and a strong economy and I'm pro-life, but because of this thing, I'm not really a conservative. And then the left-wing gays come after me all the time. They're like, you're not really gay. <laughs> I was like, you know, that's funny because I'm pretty sure there is one requirement. 
I checked the box. I'm, I am legally gay, actually, as a matter of fact. Um, and so that's always kind of a weird, uh, kind of a weird thing. Uh, sorry for the digression. Um, but I think Obergefell established same-sex marriage. There was a bipartisan bill that just passed last Congress. It's now law, the Respect for Marriage Act, a backstop if Obergefell were to go away, which I don't think it will, for all sorts of reasons. And you can ask in the Q&A about that if you want. Um, then there was a case in 2020 called Bostock, which expanded LGBT protections against discrimination. The justice who wrote that decision, Neil Gorsuch, a conservative Trump appointee. The chief justice joined him, plus the three progressives on the court. Um, actually, four. So there was, it was 6-3, that case, Bostock. Gorsuch wrote that case. Then the 303 creative case, protecting the First Amendment, was written by Neil Gorsuch. Gorsuch, a conservative justice, in my mind, got it right on both fronts, and not just on the law, but I think culturally, they are fostering, they are helping to foster a culture, a society, where we actually do embrace the sort of live and let live ethos that most Americans have on these issues. Um, so I got a lot of incoming. Uh, as you might imagine, for defending the court and praising Gorsuch, but you know the people who were screaming about this right-wing cabal who are dragging us back into the Neanderthal ages and all of this, I said, you were all sharing the Bostock decision three years ago on your Instagram story about what wonderful progress this is. It's the same justice. So do yourself a favor, and I, I got into it with some of my friends even. Um, read Gorsuch's ruling. Don't read the headlines about it. Don't read the, the overwrought, hyperbolic spin. Read the ruling, and then they were all salivating over Justice Sotomayor's dissent about how wonderful it was. It wasn't, it was terrible. It was sloppy and stupid, sorry. And he absolutely took her to the woodshed, in his opinion, because he saw her dissent and he addressed it point by point. I mean, you can read those two side by side and say that she had the better argument. It's a free country, uh, but I think most even remotely objective people would read those two and say, oh, you know what, maybe, maybe this did turn out okay. And that's where I am, uh, which, which wins me very few fans, as you might imagine, among the, the people who scream the loudest uh, on social media, but it's what I believe, so I'm comfortable with it. Ladies and gentlemen. Q and A here at this microphone, if has questions. And it can be just, from my perspective, I don't know what the rules are, with the Q&A, uh, it can be about something that I've said or one of our topics. It can be just anything. Um, if I don't want to answer it, I'll pretend to answer it and then not. How about the, how about the Cincinnati Red? What do you think of that? That one player is very exciting. They're kicking butt. Actually. Yeah. yeah. Dela Cruz? Is that, is that a... This is, these, are, these are the liberals out here. <laughs> noise I was like, not a single protester. I must be doing something wrong. Question. Hi, Mike. Uh, Hi, Mike. Right now, our national debt is one and a quarter times GDP. Our, in, our, our interest on the debt is greater than the entire DOD budget. Social Security and Medicare are now looking like they're going to go broke before the end of the world proclaimed by AOC in climate change <laughs> in 2030, so we're all done very soon. A quick, quick question. Will anybody up there that you see, either party, anywhere, have the courage to address the questions on debt, Social Security, and Medicare? Mm -hmm. They haven't addressed Social Security and Medicare for 40 years, been talking about it, mm -hmm. and it's going down. Anybody got courage to do that? So it's a great question. It's one of the most important questions. Um, I will say it is sort of funny. Uh, what's her name? Greta? Greta Thunberg uh, has been deleting tweets because she's been predicting the end of the world for years, and then when the deadline arrives, she just deletes the tweet, like it never happened. That's sort of, that's very sciency. y yeah. Um, you've asked an important question that also happens to be profoundly depressing. <laughs> uh, because one of the reasons that I am a conservative is because the math matters. Uh, and what we're doing is completely unsustainable. Uh, you know, whether you love him or not, Paul Ryan was exactly right about all of this. And they threw everything they could at him, right? The, the granny off the cliff ad and everything. And I think wrongly, the lesson from the 2012 election is, oh, that really is the third rail. It's untouchable. Uh, Ryan and 
Mitt Romney, that, that ticket, actually won seniors, I think by double digits. So I think the scaremongering didn't quite work, but the wrong lessons were learned. This is an issue where I very much disagree with Donald Trump. He might be right on the politics to some extent on it, but the math is the math. So this is not my own original thought, but right now at least, the Republican Party is the fiscally irresponsible party, and the Democratic Party is the fiscally insane party. And those are not pleasant options, right? You, you have the Republicans who don't really want to do anything. They'll talk a good game occasionally, but when they're in charge, they're going to spend like crazy. Um, they, they won't touch the two programs that need to be touched uh, because it's, if I'm being forced to pay into these things. It'll be insolvent by the time I'm scheduled to get any of it. Like it's theft. It's completely unfair. And I think there's ways to message that, but a lot of Republicans don't want to bother. The Democrats want to take those programs and expand them. Like this is, these are in their platform. They want to expand the programs. They want to take Medicare and make it socialized single payer health care. It's wild. Like they, they tried to do it in Vermont. This is a story I always give. They tried to pass single payer health care in Vermont, a homogenous, fairly wealthy white state um, filled with leftists, right? These, these are the people who want single payer the most in the country. And they ran the math and it was so completely untenable that they had to kill the bill because it was going to more than double the state budget and they had no way to pay for it. So that's their plan on a national scale. So do I prefer the Republicans saying no to further expansion to that? Yes. Is it going to solve the problem? No. So uh, you've got a handful of Republicans who I think mean it and are serious about it. Are they even a majority within the party, at least up on the Hill? Eh, prob probably not. And the point, so I, I had lunch uh, with, uh, before the State of the Union, Speaker McCarthy had a few Fox folks come in and sort of an off the record thing. And one of the things that he has said subsequently on the record so I can share, and he's, I don't think he's wrong about the politics of this, he said, these programs have to be fixed. There are some fixes that are less painful politically than others, but the only way it's gonna happen is if both parties basically come to the cliff together and make a decision together, because if one party takes the lead on it, likely the Republicans, there's too much temptation to just bludgeon it to death for political gain, kicking the can a little bit further down the road. It has to be a bipartisan thing. My fear is, I don't know if there are enough serious people left up on Capitol Hill to actually do that. And it's just, to the depression point, it is so sad that it will take yet another completely avoidable totally foreseeable crisis to maybe get them to come up with a bad temporary solution to it. But that's, I think, the reality. Thank you. Next question. We've heard a lot about the divisions within the United States. Uh, I'm from Chicago, working on ranch choice voting for Chicago mm -hmm. to bring us together as a city. What election reforms or other reforms, how are we going to get out of this? You wrote your book, and I'll, what is it like? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So ranked choice voting is interesting. Um, so in Australia, they have compulsory voting and ranked choice voting. Um, I don't support either of them, even though I think it works relatively well for them. The issue with the biggest problem I have with ranked choice voting, even though in theory, I think it's intriguing and, and maybe a good idea. There's such a deficit in trust in our election systems right now that to introduce a new complication into them where there's a lot of behind the scenes, sort of behind the curtain, well, this person dropped out, so their votes go to this person. I think there's too many moving parts to instill confidence in people who have shaken confidence as it is. That's one of the concerns I have about ranked choice voting. Um, is there a, a silver bullet solution to this? I don't think so. One thing that I would like to see explored, and there are smart people thinking about this all the time, is is there a way <clears throat> to encourage more mainstream people having a better chance of success in primaries? Because, and you know, people rail against gerrymandering when it affects their side negatively, but both sides absolutely love to gerrymander. And there's only a relative handful of seats out of the 435 that are competitive anymore. 
in a, in a really major year, it'll be, you know, five dozen seats would be potentially on the table. Most seats are safe for one party or the other, and, and it's a small universe of hardcore people who decide who the nominee is. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a healthy thing for the country, where you have a deeply polarized Congress that's much more polarized, I think, than the country actually is itself. Um, and I think you start to see this spiral into crazy on both sides of the aisle, uh, and, and a party afraid of its own base, um, which makes compromise harder, because compromise is not incentivized within a primary process, although it is incentivized in a general election setting, for the most part, sort of broadly speaking. I don't really know the best way to, to, to fix that. I, I would say one, one example that gives me a little bit of hope is I live in Virginia, and the Virginia Republican Party was going in a death spiral direction. Right? So I remember growing up, it was a red state. Bush won it twice, and then you know, Obama had his big moment, and he won Virginia, but then <clears throat> there was a big swing back in 2010. But then he won Virginia again. And then Hillary won Virginia. And then Biden won Virginia by 10. And every single statewide official was a Democrat by 2021, all of them, and had been for years. There were a few close calls, but the Republicans were veering not only towards statewide quasi-extinction, but seeming to get crazier and angrier about it. And finally, just for a moment, the fever seemed to break, and Glenn Youngkin was the nominee. And he ran, seeing it up close and personal, an absolutely masterful campaign in Virginia. Terry McAuliffe helped uh, with a few really bad foot-and-mouth moments on education where schools were the number one issue in that election. And then Youngkin won by you know, three points. So that was, that was a swing of 13 points over Joe Biden's margin. And it wasn't just Youngkin. It was Winsome Sears, the lieutenant governor, is a real badass. She won. Uh, the, the attorney general, Mayoris, also won. They, they swept statewide that year. Now, it was under sort of perfect circumstances, but it was a Republican running a cheerful, smart, general election campaign with both the base completely behind him, 100 I percent. Mean, the Republican turnout in the Trump counties and, and the rural counties was just staggering. But then also some of the independents, former Republicans, Republican curious people who had drifted away from the party recently, they felt like he was a safe harbor where they could say, all right, we're not happy with what's happening with the COVID restrictions and the schools and some of this craziness. Um, we trust him, and they went and they went for Yunkin. And by the way, last I saw a couple weeks ago, his approval rating is plus 22 in Virginia. He's above water by 22 points in Virginia. So he's governing competently and smartly, and not leaning into every single sort of right-wing obsession. Uh, he, he's been smart, and I think, just speaking for myself as a voter, I think our base needs to give our our side, our politicians, a little bit more breathing room to be smart and to win elections. Because being the purest of pure is wonderful, but if you lose because of that, then the other side has the power, and we're seeing what's happening when the other side has the power. So I think in order to change the trajectory, you have to be able to govern, and you can't govern if you can't win. So I think we have to take a long, hard look at our choices and prioritize winning, because the other side's really good at that. For the most part, the other side, look, they saw Bernie, basically won Iowa, won New Hampshire, and they said, we can't have this man, he will lose. And they got everyone in line and they all dropped out like in, within a span of two days, remember that? They had all these people with a future ahead of them and their own pathways to victory and then just like one after another, the dominoes fell. And they all saluted and endorsed Joe Biden because they just decided they had to prioritize winning and he was the best shot. I'm not saying that the Republicans should be exactly that, sort of just, you know, lockstep marchers. We're a little bit more individualistic on our side. But politics is a team sport, and, the, and you got to win. you got to win the game if you want to make some changes. So I'm, I'm very much thinking, sometimes obsessively, about I'm into pol policy, of course, but you, it's all an afterthought if you're tinkering about some policy in the minority. We have time for one more question. Uh, speaking of winning, I'm going to ask the audience a question, oh. and then we'll turn to our guests. 
I have no idea how this is going to come out. Speaking of cheerful, bright, engaging, winnable candidates, how many of you, raise your hand, that's all you have to do, regardless of whether you are inclined to vote for Republicans and conservatives or not, would at least be willing to entertain the possibility that Mike Huckabee would be a better candidate than anybody out there now? Mike Huckabee? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hang on. Bingo. I had Mike Huckabee on my bingo card. So I'm, I'm so glad we got to it. Uh, look, if we're going to talk about Huckabees, Sarah, Sarah Sanders. Let's, so Mike Huckabee is, is, can be very likable, and he's got his TV show. I think he has zero interest in running again. He tried twice. He ran in 16 and 08. Uh, I think that ship has sailed. Um, but from that family, his daughter, uh, so far, so good in Arkansas. She's got a presence. She's smart. I think the State of the Union response she gave was terrific. Um, keep an eye on her, for sure. Keep an eye on her. Keep an eye on Kim Reynolds in Iowa. Uh, there's, there's a handful of folks who aren't at the top, top level yet, but are very interesting to me, and she's one of them. Who's the best one? Right now? Oh, gosh. No, who's the best one to win who would be good? So, so look, so someone said Yunkin. Let me say this. If, if you could just snap your fingers and it's November of 2024 and by some miracle it's Glenn Yunkin against Joe Biden, I think Yunkin trounces him. I think he absolutely trounces him. Do I think there's any chance that Glenn Yunkin is the nominee? No. A very, very slim one. To me, it's one of two people in all likelihood. And... Uh, we have smart people in the room. I think you guys can tell which of those options I personally prefer if it's down to those two. Neither of them are my perfect favorite Republican conservative candidate of all time, but you, you work with what you've got um, and you make a calculation based on who has the best chance of winning a primary and a general. Um, and look, there's 12 choices right now and we can talk about guys who aren't on the ballot. There are folks who are at least, their hats are in the ring. I think they all deserve a look. And then ultimately, by the time the votes start rolling in, who can actually win? I think we have to prioritize that, and we'll see if we do. So the answer to the question is Glenn Youngkin. I think in a vacuum, I think Youngkin would win a general election pretty handily. But is that, is that yes? I, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people in the country. Um, I think that we could do a lot better than what we have right now. Um, yeah, I, I think theoretically, Yunkin. Practically speaking, it won't be him. So then, who's up? Who's up to bat? Thank you all so much for having me. This was so much fun. Really appreciate it. Before we leave, I have to present this to you. Oh my gosh.